Okay, so um, I'm going to be talking about how we manage services using GitOps and GraphQL. Um, this talk is a story about our team, the Apisary team within Red Hat. Um, I'm one of the SREs in this team. And uh, what I'm going to talk about is uh, our evolution, our evolution since last year into this year, and how we use the GitOps to to design a way to, to scale up. So last year we were running just one service. We were running basically just one, and we decided that we, we basically were seeing that we weren't able to scale up. So we tried to implement a system uh, based on GitOps to allow us to deliver more services. So now today we are uh, managing 17 services, and yeah, that's. Uh, when we try to deploy, the, uh, build the GitOps um, uh, solution that we implemented, we identified a few challenges and we built uh, a few tools around these challenges to alleviate them. And I'm going to talk about those especially. Uh, these tools, at the core of the idea that we used, we borrowed the um, Kubernetes programming model, specifically the idea of, the con of controllers. We tried to create controllers. Uh, we call them integrations, but this, it's a, the same idea applies. Um, that essentially um, um, will reconcile the state, the current state, to the desired state with the current state, just like um, operators do in Kubernetes. I will talk about the integrations that we have and how we build them and how everything fits together. And uh, the last thing is, um, you know, what, what are the things that we can improve in, in this uh, platform and what is the roadmap ahead? So let's start by the team. Um, uh, the team is called App SRE. It stands for Application SRE. And our goal is to run uh, internal services and deploy them in OpenShift dedicated. The key idea is that we are regular customers of OpenShift dedicated. So we consume them in the exact same way that customers will uh, consume um, uh, OpenShift dedicated. And what is OpenShift dedicated? Well, it's just a um, fully managed uh, Kubernetes offer offering that Red Hat has. And you can, uh, it's, it's a product you can buy, well, uh, it's a service you can buy, a uh, subscription, and you're able to you know, deploy services and de de deploy your applications in these OpenShift clusters. OpenShift dedicated is um, fully managed by Red Hat, and it has one thing that I think it's worth mentioning. They, uh, you don't receive, as a tenant, as a customer of this product, you don't have a cluster admin, because uh, the cluster is being managed by an other teams in Red Hat. Um, so what you get is um, another thing that we call it uh, dedicated admin, and will essentially allow you to be ad become admin in all the namespaces. This is just a minor detail, but I think it's interesting, because um, Red Hat builds OpenShift dedicated, and even though we are inside Red, our team is in Red Hat, we consume it as customers. So we have to abide by the by the requirements and by the by the um, by the way the service works. So I, I said we run services and applications. I guess I have to explain what uh, kind of applications we run. Typically, the applications are uh, web applications or microservices that compose a bigger service than themselves. I'm going to talk about two examples of things that we run. We run um, these four projects, uh, Telemeter Cincinnati OCM, which starts, stands for OpenShift Cluster Management and Hive. And all these uh, services um, in themselves, they compose um, the OpenShift dedicated for provisioning uh, platform. So when you go to cloud.redhat.com slash OpenShift, you will see uh, a UI, and if you, uh, this will allow you to deploy uh, OSD clusters provided that you have a sub subscription. And everything that builds the OpenShift clusters and deploys them, is th uh, those are services that we run. And it's interesting, I, 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 I like this a lot, because we are running an OpenShift. It's a chicken and egg situation. We are running the service 
on OpenShift that allows you to provision OpenShift. So I think it's interesting, and I think it um, relates very well, it, um, uh, exposes very well the capabilities of OpenShift dedicated because uh, meaning this means that you're able to build things as complex as a platform, you know, uh, that man a fully managed platform just with uh, OpenShift dedicated. Another example is Eclipse Che, che.openshift.io. It's an online IDE. You can go there and you can use it. It's um, an online IDE that has uh, interesting features. So, uh, running a service. How do we run a service? Well, the theory is very simple, right? We just uh, generally have two environments, staging and production. We, um, the developers, they give us uh, Kubernetes deployments, and we just run them, like OC apply, or OC or kubectl apply. We have to provision other OpenShift resources like config maps, secrets, and if they ask for databases, we provision on RDS, etc. But in order to be, to, in order for it to be possible for us to offer this to the customers, we have to manage the. When I say customers, I mean internal developers that are the owners of this service. We have to manage them. We have to give them access to the clusters. We have to manage the role bindings. Um, ask them for uh, for their usernames. Set up the pipelines so they are able to do actually, you know, promotion to staging, promotion to prod. So this is generally the, the, the idea is very simple, but um, in the end it gets a bit convoluted because you have to manage a lot of things. So let me introduce to you a few of the things that we had to deal with back in 2018. Our goal, we are SREs, right? So we try to automate everything, but. Um, like every interaction that we had with the developers meant like a different thing that we had to do, and we kept building stuff. For instance, in this case, is, is um, a new developer that comes and says, "Hey, I want to deploy a service." So what do we do? We uh, create a new namespace and provision the resources they want. Of course, this is automated. We had a script that does this. So. Um, this introduces two things, manual processes, which the manual process is running a script that provisions all the things that they require to be bootstrapped, and uh, Jenkins pipelines. So we are able you know, to, to um, deliver the pipelines that they will need to actually um, uh, lifecycle these jobs, these um, services. Another example is when they came to us asking, hey, we need that database. And uh, at first, for a long time, we were just provisioning the databases through the AWS console. And that was a lot of clicking. So we ended up using Terraform. So now we have another thing. We have Terraform. And in order to send them the passwords for the database, we had to ask them for the GPG keys, right? Um, so, so we could send them send them the password. <clears throat> Another example, which cost a lot of this, this one was quite problematic, is when a new a new team member came, we had to grant them access to all the namespaces. How do we know what namespaces do they need access to? In what clusters? What namespaces? We had to keep uh, a log of what the teams were. Who were the members of the teams? What namespaces they owned? And we had to, you know, we had a, a data repository in which we included all this data. When they wanted to create a secret, same story. Uh, they, they had to give it to us encrypted, so we had to exchange GPG keys, and well, they had, uh, we had to just send them the GPG key, and we would also apply it. And then we would save it locally in, a, in an encrypted Git that the developers didn't have access to. So you know where I'm getting at. This was a bit of a mess. We uh, got a lot of team interrupts, people say, developers saying, hey, we want to do this, and uh, we got stuck. Uh, at this stage. Uh, manual reconciliation was a problem. If someone left the team, uh, we had to uh, deprovision them from the clusters, from GitHub organizations, all these things, and we had to keep track of those. So we, we had another data repositories where we kept track of these things and separate scripts that dealt with this. So the year summary was that, was that we had a lot of processes. We had a bunch of scripts uh, written by different SREs in our team, uh, some in Go, some in Python, some in Bash. Um, 
we deployed a lot of services. They weren't interconnected. Each one, well, of course, we automated stuff. We were using Ansible. We were using Jenkins jobs to provision things. We were using uh, small GitOps implementations. So when you committed something to a repo, something, a repo, something happened. So in the end, we were just running uh, one service. And we had a bit of a mess. And we really needed to get out of this because the, the, the idea for the team was to be able to run a lot more services. So fast forward uh, one year. Um, the, the, the previous slide would finish about a year ago, more or less, 2018, around uh, yeah, after summer, uh, more or less September or so. And nowadays, we're running this. We're running 17 services, managing 250 uh, developers, uh, lots of roles, lots of permissions, AWS accounts, uh, query orgs. And we do this uh, with the same seven members that we were. But the, the, the people have changed, but the number has stayed the same. And uh, we, are, we think that we're prepared to scale a lot more. Uh, we are uh, basically doing this using the solution that we built around uh, GitOps. So let's go, let's uh, talk a bit about the solution itself. This is the naive approach, the initial approach. This is the, the, the design that we had in our minds. Um, let's have a Git repo with everything that we have. With just one single repo. And the whole goal is that if someone wants to do something, they just send a PR, and when we merge it, something is going to happen that will you know, configure the service, the person, onboard someone, offboard someone, etc. So we thought that we wanted to um, do this using reconciliation loops uh, in, in the Kubernetes style of things. You have uh, different scripts that this, the, this box here, uh, this box here, oops, uh, represents the several scripts. And each script is like one controller, one Kubernetes controller that does one thing. Um, deploy OpenShift scripts, uh, manage GitHub organizations, manage query re registries, things like this. And the idea was very pretty, but uh, we identified several things that we didn't like, and I will get that to that in a minute. So let me talk a little bit more about reconciliation loop for, loops for Kubernetes. The reconciliation loops, um, there have been some talks today about these things, the, um, the controllers, and um, I'm not going to do a better job, but um, I want to um, explain exactly what we borrowed from, from this idea. The first thing for me personally was that we were changing from an imperative model to a declarative model. Instead of saying, hey, we want to do this, we are running this script, the idea was to describe your desired state. It's declarative. And then something will happen that will um, evolve the current state to your desired state. In Kubernetes, same thing happens. You have uh, your user providing your desired state, which resides in etcd. A simple infinite loop that repeats again and again and again. And controllers, which in our uh, GitHub setup we call them integrations, um, they watch specific resource types like um, uh, replica sets and they deal with the differences. If, well, the user wants a replica set with seven pods, but there are only uh, six pods, I have to deploy a new pod. So it reconciles the state. So this is what we wanted to do, and this is what we wanted to translate to the GitOps world. So we were in the, on, the, on a good track, single Git repo, reconciliation loop, but we found four big problems. The first thing is schema validation. I will talk about this uh, uh, in the next slide. And then we have three interconnected problems, which are data redundancy, repeated logic, and language independence. We found that if we did this, the integrations repeated a lot of code where um, we had a there was a lot of logic in the integrations that was simply you know, uh, reading from the Git repo, loading the files, doing stuff that is really, that wasn't, um, um, didn't provide any value. You could say, well, you could write a library to alleviate that, but if we do that, uh, then we are bound to one, we are uh, tied to one language. And we wanted something that would allow us to deploy you know, one controller, one integration in Go, another one write it in Python, another one in Bash. That, that, that was the whole idea. So 
going back to the schema validation, let's say I have a script that will read from the Git repo, and it expects someone to define um, a user this way, a field called uh, name, a field called GitHub username, and uh, a list of permissions where every permission is has those three items to say something. What happens if someone, you know, because the whole idea here is to be able to self-service this. Um, so developers will be sending PRs. What if they make a mistake? What if instead of um, typing GitHub username, they type GitHub underscore user? The script will fail because it's expecting GitHub username. What if uh, they omit the org? Uh, it's a required field and integration needs it. So common schema validation problems, the, the most obvious ones are typos and missing required fields. But there are a lot more. Like if there's a field that represents an email address, we want to apply a regular expression and ensure that it's an email address or a URL, things like this. So this is something that we wanted to fix um, in order to be able to set this up. The three other things, uh, data and application logic redundancy and, uh, and language independence, this one is a bit harder to explain, I think. But the idea is that, let's say we have two, 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 mem two developers, um, Jaime Melis and Robert Johansson, and they are both in the same team. Chances are they will have the same collection of permissions. Does this mean that we will need to write, you know, in the two different files the same, the same list of permissions? What happens if we want to add a permission? We have to modify all the members of the team. So it's obvious at this point that what we need is a database. We need something that will allow us to, to, um, to pr provide some normalization to this. So. This would, this would be the ideal solution. Instead of saying a, a list of permissions, I just want to ref, uh, reference a role. And I want this role to be defined in another file, right? So whenever I modify this file, it affects all the people that are using this role. So we wanted to do GitOps with uh, the ability to do um, uh, relationships, uh, re re uh, re relationships and foreign keys and things like this. Also, if we solve this problem, if somehow we could expose this, we would be solving the language independence problem as well, because we would be consuming something that is already able to solve all these problems and is exposing this information to us. So let me introduce you to the two components that we built, uh, the two main components. The first one is a schema validation. This is just a Python, in reality it's just a Python script that will check every file in the Git repo against a, a schema. And that's all it does. And it's super simple and it's, uh, um, it was very easy to write. The other part, uh, one that is a bit more compl complex, is that in between the Git repo and the integrations, we deployed the contract server. That's the, our name for a GraphQL server that essentially knows how to read the data from the Git repo and exposes it via GraphQL. With this in place, we, we believed that we, that we were solving all the things that we had identified as problems. So, uh, the contract validator. Let me uh, explain you how it works. It's extremely easy, as I said. That's the URL if you want to open it. Um, it's a, just a Python script which uses a Python package called JSON schema, and it uses JSON schema um, to validate the documents. So, this is it's a shortened real example. Uh, every every um, Every document in the Git repo has a reference to a schema that will validate it. And the schema is just a schema like they have uh, defined them in the spec, in the, in the, in the JSON schema spec, uh, RFC. So you can say things, okay, so this has to be an object because it's a, it's, it's a dictionary of fields. Uh, we define only two fields, name and GitHub username. We don't allow any additional properties and both of them are required. If you try to do something that doesn't match this, it will fail and the PR will get uh, rejected. Uh, so this idea was super simple. Uh, it, it really was 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 that um, contract server. This is GraphQL. Let me um, explain briefly what uh, GraphQL is. Is 
GraphQL is a query language, just like REST API. Um, when you implement a service and you want to expose an API, instead of um, implementing a REST API, you can uh, implement a GraphQL API. And I will demo this in a bit, so, you, so if you, in case you have never played with GraphQL, you will see how, how, how the query language works. Um, it has um, GraphQL provides, provides server runtime and tooling, so it's very easy to build the schemas that you need for GraphQL in order to um, uh, create the server. It allows for queries and mutations. You can mutate data. In our case, we are not using mutations because we are mutating the data directly in the Git repo, not via GraphQL, because we want things to be PRs uh, because we are doing GitOps. Um, an interesting thing is that you only get the fields that you request. And uh, the, la the box there is an example of a GraphQL schema. This defines a character, a type character, and it has two fields, name, which is a string, and it has an ex exclamation mark, meaning that it's required. And appears in is an array, because it's square brackets, of episodes, and there's an exclamation mark, meaning that it cannot be null, it has to be there, and also the array has to be there in itself. It, it cannot be null, it has to be at least an empty array. As you can see, this uh, work fits in very nicely with the JSON schema. We are defining required fields, uh, whether or not they are strings, whether or not they are arrays. So there was a very, it was very clear to us that GraphQL was a good solution to mix with uh, JSON schemas. So our implementation, the contract server, uh, it's, uh, we wrote it in, in Node.js with uh, Apollo GraphQL. We are not uh, we, uh, we are not uh, Node we are not Node JS develop developers, but we uh, we believed at the moment that the ecosystem for uh, GraphQL was miles ahead in the JavaScript world, so we went with that, and I think we made a good choice. We wrote it in TypeScript, quoting someone from the team. It's the only way to write uh, sane, uh, sane JavaScript, and I think it's uh, it's awesome. And essentially, it exposes the Git repo data and allows you to solve the references so uh, you can uh, remove the duplication of code. So basically, it's a, it's a relational, relational database. We have files that are users, files that are roles, files that are permissions, and we can establish relationships with them. Um, so if you query a user, you can say, hey, so what roles does this user have? Because it's in the spec. In the JSON schema, we, have that we, have the, we are saying that the roles, that the user has a, a, a parameter which is roles that, it, that uh, points to a role. Yeah, so this solves all other problems that, 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 we, that we had. And there's another, uh, there's another cool thing that Contract Server does, and I think it's the coolest thing that it does. It, uh, it allows you to do back references. The idea is that in the schema, we're not defining users. Users not there. We're just defining, uh, I, mean, I mean the yellow box. We're not defining the yellow box. But Contract Server is smart. And if you query roles and say, hey, what are the users that are pointing to this role? They will, it will show us the user. So we're able to, just by loading this data in the contract server, in the GraphQL server, um, we're able to navigate through the, the foreign keys relationships. And that's what uh, makes this powerful, I think. So we, we've made a, a bunch of assumptions about what's in the Git repo. In, in, and the Git repo has to, has to um, satisfy the requirements that contract uh, server imposes. It has to have a collection of data files, and each data file uh, has to be YAML or JSON. It has to have a key, which is a schema, which points to a file will validate, which validates it. And if you want to reference another file, you simply define a key, which is $ref, and the path to the other file, the relative path to the other file. And that's it. That's all you need to do. You also need to provide the JSON schema validation files and say, user one has these required fields, et cetera. And unfortunately, we still have to provide the GraphQL schemas, but this is something that will be going away soon because we want to be able to generate, we can generate the GraphQL schemas from the JSON schemas. There are a couple of things we need to solve before we get there, but that's where we're going. So only the two first things are there in the long run. 
OK, so I'm going to do a demo. And in this demo, I'm going to show you a few data files in, in, one of the, in, in this repo. I'm going to show you the, how the validation uh, works. I'm going to show you how the contract server, the GraphQL server, also works. And um, yeah, have a quick overview of the GraphQL query language. But, OK, I'm going to try and do it here. But um, I cannot mirror uh, the laptop because I'm in Wayland, so I don't, I don't know. <laughs> So this is the repo. This is the app interface. This is our Git repo. We call it app interface. Inside the data folder, we have the data files that we are going to be exposing. You'll see we only have four here in this example. I removed everything else so to, in order to keep it uh, simple. The, we have um, um, a couple of users, a role, and a permission. So let's open the let's open this user. This user has a schema file which points to the schema file that we will we will take a look at uh, now, and it has you know the field. It's a regular uh, YAML file. It could also be JSON, and it has all the all the things that we need. Uh, in reality, uh, my uh, this is my user. It has like ten roles or something like that. I just uh, removed all of them. You have the GPG key and all these things. So everything that we know about the service is here. Um, The roles is just a collection of permissions. As you can see, there's $ref, which points to another uh, file. And this, will, this uh, contract server understands, understands this. And now I'm going to show you the schema for user. This is a real schema that we're using for users. It has uh, all the fields that we require, all the fields that are possible. It's actually quite simple. It's just a regular JSON schema. OK, so um, okay. Sorry. <laughs> okay, so here it is. I can't see anything. <laughs> okay, so let's start with users. This is a GraphQL, a regular GraphQL server. So we have, actually, I, I, I can't do them like this. I'm going to connect the other laptop.
Okay, much better. Okay, so we are going to query the users, and um, we simply need to define the fields that we want. And this returns the users from the contract server. Now, the cool thing about GraphQL is that you define the fields that it, the fields that you want. So you could do something like uh, Red Hat username, and this will give you the Red Hat username. But um, if you remember, in the user file, we had a role, which a, ro a roles uh, array, which pointed to other roles. If we let me prettyify this a bit. If we list the roles that we want, there, there you go. There, uh, you, now you have the roles. We, we just went down to the. We, we're retrieving the data from other files now. Or the description. We can uh, visualize the the path to. Right. So I'm just re uh, telling the data that I want uh, it to return. And uh, let me see if there's a note, notepad here. I don't know. Um, if we do copy, well, if I click copy curl and I paste it somewhere, I will see that it's just a regular uh, curl, that it's uh, the payload is it's just that string. It uh, uses the string that I have on my left, and it returns the JSON. So this means I can do this in any language. Also, another thing that is super cool about GraphQL is that it has introspection. Uh, just the server itself allows you to return uh, all the things that we, you can query. So we can query users, and the users have all these labels, and uh, we can go to roles, and inside roles we have users again. You, you know, th this is the whole relationship of the de of the database that I was showing you, and it's uh, available here. This is the official GraphQL tooling. I'm not doing anything. I'm just starting a GraphQL server, providing it with the schema, and this is automatic. So this is uh, this is one of the reasons we went with Node.js to deploy this because all of this uh, ec um, ecosystem was amazing to to use, and we're just implementing the logic that resolves these references. And that's basically all that, all that we're doing. And uh, the back references is uh, if we do roles v1. Now we can look. We, we can query the the users, and this is not defined in the, in the data files. This is something that. This is something that a contract server knows how to do just because it looks at the schema, relationship in the schema, and it builds all the, all the direct relationships and the back references. Okay, so this was the demo for the GraphQL server. Does anyone have any question regarding the GraphQL query language? I find it super cool because just return, obtain the data that you want and that's it. Okay. Okay, just a few more slides left. Um, so we've talked about the upper part of the stack. Now I want to talk about the integrations. How do we write them and what are the, what are they? So integrations are extremely simple to, to be writ written. They just need to uh, follow these small patterns. Um, they fetch the desired state by contacting the GraphQL server. They fetch the current state by uh, using the API of whichever service you're managing, GitHub, uh, Vault, Jenkins, um, Quay, whatever. You have to do it in such a way that it's idempotent. So if you run it again and again, uh, things uh, won't break. If you try to create something that already exists, uh, you cannot raise an error. You have to say, OK, you, you silently fail. You say, OK, this was already created. We can run them in any language. We can write them in any language. And in fact, we do. 
And a very important thing is that they all have to have a minus minus dry run flag. So we are able to simulate what happens on every PR. So the PR comes in, we will run all the all the all the all the list of integrations and we'll see you know what what is this this PR is going to do. So let's look at one integration, a simple one. Defining, qu defining query registries. The logic is what I just said. Desired state from GraphQL, current state from the query rest, AP, query rest API. We iterate through the uh, desired state. If they are not in the current state, we create them. If they are different, we modify them. And then we iterate through the um, current state. And if they are not in the desired state, we remove them. It's just like a Kubernetes controller. That's, a, that's the exact, thing, exact thing you would do. And we implement, you implement dry run. If you implement dry run, you only print what you would do instead of doing it. So it's pretty much uh, trivial. Um, this is the query that you would have. Um, on the left is a, a developer defining the registries that they want. They point to a, a query organization and the list of registries that they want, for instance. And in our integration, we just request the data like this. We, we um, uh, create this query in GraphQL, return the data, and do all the logic based on the results here. So it's, it fits in very nicely. And the, and the good thing is that because the data was already validated, we know this is not going to we know this is not going to uh, give us false information. As in, if uh, name is supposed to be there, it will be there. And if the name is supposed to not be a null value, it won't be a null value. So nowadays, this, this is the list of integrations that we have. We write them uh, super quickly. So we have integrations that deploy resources to the OpenShift clusters, manage query repos, vault configurations, uh, um, I don't know, AWS resources. We have a lot of things, and we have everything. Uh, we, we retrieve everything from the single Git repo, and we follow this pattern, and, we're, and this is allowing us to scale a lot. Another interesting thing is uh, what happens when a, a developer sends us a PR? How do we how do we how do we decide whether or not to merge it? Well, every time a PR is sent to this repo. Uh, there's a, all the integrations are run with the minus minus dry run, and we get a report. So if the, if the developer has deleted all the users, we would be able to see it, and we would uh, refuse to merge that uh, PR. If there are any problems, there are any schema validation problems, everything, we will be able to, to look at it just by looking at this report, and we have all the information that we need to, to know whether or not if we should merge it. Another tool that we build around this is Visual Contract. Visual Contract is um, essentially the Git repo that we have has a lot of references going from one document to another. And navigating this as a human sometimes is a bit confusing. If you if you want to follow stuff, you have to keep you know uh, jumping from one file to another. So the Visual Contract is just a React app that uh, displays this information. So we have. Um, Services, clusters, namespaces, users, everything, you know, like the Grafana dashboards, they are linked from the namespaces. If you go to clusters, you will see the namespaces, and the namespaces you will see, like everything is interconnected. You can uh, navigate from one to another. Uh, this is just a screenshot of the repo that I currently have, in which I only have two users. Uh, normally, I think we have 250 or so. And uh, if I click on one, uh, you will see something that is quite interesting, which is the edit button. And the edit button only sends you back to the to the um, to the page in the in the Git repo. It's a GitLab repo, so it sends you back to GitLab. As in, if you want to modify it, simply send a PR, modify this file, and that's it. So it's just a link. But uh, at some point, we will probably have a dynamic uh, web form. So based on the JSON schema, you could uh, generate a dynamic web web form to modify these fields and send an automatic PR, but we're not yet there yet. 
Uh, feature work. Um, as I said, dynamically generated the GraphQL schema. That is one of my things that I would like to, to work on um, soon, because it's a bit of a pain to have to maintain the validation, to maintain the schemas in two places, in JSON and GraphQL format. Uh, it's a bit tricky, but uh, I think we, we're in a good place to, to solve this problem. Another a weakness, that, a problem that we have is that the documents are validated in the context of themselves. We are able to see if there are fields that are missing, etc. but we don't know, the validation will not look at other, at other um, documents when it's validating. This means that there are simple things like uniqueness that we are not enforcing. Someone could define twice the same Red Hat username. And that is a problem. And we, we, I think we have a good strategy to solve this, which is essentially running GraphQL, defining GraphQL queries that need to that need to pass in order for the PR to be merged. And if we do, if we set it up in such a way that they are easy to define, then we will be able to, you know, say, okay, this PR can go through because it's repeating a field that is already being used somewhere else. Productize. Um, one of the obvious questions is, uh, can this be used? And it, it, can, it can be used, but it's a pain to set up the, the, um, the logic to run the integrations. We're currently doing it in, the Jen in Jenkins using webhooks, so when, there's a P when the PR is merged, there's a webhook that, or when the PR is submitted, there's a webhook that triggers the, um, the Jenkins job and runs the integrations. And we really don't dislike this approach, and we would like to do an operator, a Kubernetes operator, so it, um, you define basically in the CRD the integrations that you want to run, and it listens for th it, it listens for things like this. Once we have this, I I think it would be easy to deploy this. As of now, the the biggest problem, the biggest challenge that someone has if they try to deploy this, is setting up the whole logic to run the integrations. And uh, the last thing is the automatic PR merges. Um, our work right now, a lot of part, a big, a big part of our work is um, reviewing PRs, and we want to automate that. We want to be able to define some tests. Um, so, for instance, one thing that we want to enforce is if someone tries to modify a PR, a service that they don't belong to. Uh, yeah, we, can, we should fail that PR. And that now is a manual process. We look at it and we say, hey, this guy is trying to modify the service, but he doesn't, uh, he isn't part of the service. So we want to do something uh, similar to GitHub owners, to the GitHub owners file, but using, again, GraphQL queries based on the output and uh, things like this. So the conclusion, uh, just to finish. Um, I think uh, in this talk there are too many ideas I want to I want to convey, which are uh, the rectification loop, the declarative the declarative approach is amazing. We found it to be useful, and in this use case, um, I think I don't know. I think it changes the way um, it changes. It improves a lot of things, a lot of things, and it can be used in many different scenarios. So perhaps uh, trying to you could it, it may be useful to try to evaluate if you can borrow this. This uh, declarative approach and applied uh, elsewhere. And the other thing, a lesson learned in, from 2018 for us was that automation is necessary and we have to do automation. But you have to do it with uh, a plan and design. If you start automating, uh, in the end, it's um, in the end, it's, it's, it will end up being, a com I don't know, confusing, complex, and you won't be able to scale up. Sorry. <laughs> and yeah, these are the links for the projects, if you want to look at them. And that's my email. If anyone has any questions. What was the reason you wanted language uh, one of the reasons I could see is for the TypeScript thing you mentioned for GraphQL. But outside that, why Python? Why not on Golang? So, so for instance, we have an integration. Um, we have an integration which is, it's this one. Oops. Vault configuration. Vault configuration, the integration, we wrote it in Go. Because um, HashiCorp Vault is, has the main APIs in Go, and we wrote it in Go. Um, it, 
uh, for instance, the query repos make sense to write it in Python and not use, not really use Go. So we really didn't want to be bound to a single, to a single. Um, a language, and that's why we, we try to follow this approach to have something that will expose the data in such a way that it can consume it from a language using just HTTP, which is essentially what the GraphQL client is. It's just an HTTP client. It was like you read my mind. Because I did have a question, but I didn't raise my hand yet. Um, so my question is about GitOps. So I am new to this concept of GitOps, although everything behind it is very familiar. Um, it seems that one of the features of it is the idea of a pull request that's just checking the difference between desired and current state. And then that PR is really what makes this a GitOps process rather than you know just a continuous delivery process. But you want to get rid of the PR part and automate that. Does that, does that mean there's some sort of flaw with GitOps? Okay, so um, I don't want to get rid of the, of the PR check. I want to automate the creation of PRs. So the edit button, this thing I, I said about creating dynamic forms, would essentially allow the developer to send a PR, not modify anything. So the PR will still be there. We'll have traceability, auditability, who sent this PR, and we'll have a simulation of what, what would happen if we merge it. So the PR would be there. But uh, you said other th another thing, which is that PR, the PRs are the essence of GitOps, and they are indeed a very important part, but I think the most important part is uh, just um, having in GitOps a state that you want to see deployed. So PRs are extremely useful because it's a benefit that you get from uh, GitOps, but I think that the, the, the main thing is just being able to apply that state. Uh, one more question, please. Um, with respect to the world integration you have, so in that case, the secrets, for example, are still not encrypted on HCD. Rather, it's encrypted in your store. Something pulls that secret out, decrypts it, and puts, puts it on that HCD, right? Exactly. I, th I think it's exactly what you said. We, yeah. uh, the developer, puts the secret in Vault. And in, in our GitOps, they say, hey, apply this Vault um, document, this Vault secret, apply it in this namespace. And the integration, what it does, it simply um, uh, obtains the data from Vault and creates an actual secret in Kubernetes. And that's it. And it's version, so they can control, they can do rollbacks and do the kind of, that kind of thing. So, so yeah. Right, so, um, so HashiCorp has a newer thing where it has an init container uh, which effectively d uh, ensures that you don't even have to write the secret unencrypted onto etcd. Is that something you've considered and found no, not a good idea? Just okay, to... so we saw this a, a while ago, I think, and the problem was that we weren't sure if we could run this in OpenShift dedicated, because in order to install that, we needed required cluster admin. So we didn't have this. But the good, great thing is that if you have this, uh, writing an integration that does that is tr trivial, right? So. This is just, yeah. Thank you. Okay, one last question, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Uh, I'm not too familiar with uh, GraphQL. Is that um, so? That's taking the data from that's defined in the Git repo, and is it storing somewhere? So, so it's just parsing that directly. So GraphQL is not uh, it doesn't have anything to do with Git repos. What we're uh, when you create a GraphQL service, uh, it's like when you create a REST API service. You have to implement the logic, right? In our case, the logic is go to the GitHub, the Git repo, and uh, uh, and return this data. But it's our logic, the one that uh, obtains the data from the from the Git repo, not GraphQL. GraphQL is simply a way to to um, it, it's it's just an API, uh, an API specification. Okay, thanks a lot for coming.